Welcome to a Saturday. Um, I didn't have a video last week simply because I blew this computer up. Um, but what we're going to talk about is how I blew it up and some of the things I learned and you know hindsight is 2020 what I should have done. So let us begin. So normally um, you can update uh, your Linux most likely two different ways command line or you could come down here to the little updating house there's a thing in here um, updates like so I prefer to do the CLI now since this is a Ubuntu based system normally you can do an apt update for example first of all to make sure your repos are up to date okay which shows that now if you ever get any warnings in here you have to go and edit your etc app sources.list.d directory and find that particular repo fix it or comment it out so that it doesn't come I did all that that was fine that was not a problem the next stitch you do is you do either apt upgrade like so and let me just make this a little bigger um, or and this is the recommended way in KDE to do it app get instead answer yes to the questions and do this now I do know in KDE Neon this is not all distros um, there's a couple of libraries that they want only to have the older version so you do allow downgrades so it just makes sure that there's a couple of packages that depend on the older libraries and they don't want them updated so you would do that and you go along and it would okay after you're all done right you're finished and everything should be good um, you possibly get this effect where it says these are no longer required so you do apt Uh, remove I believe it's in here somewhere yeah auto remove dash Y and it's going to clean up the system will maintain uh, like three I think previous kernels and whatever so this is like one of the oldest ones it's removing a couple old ones right um, you can see this here uh, 5499 build it's getting rid of it because we're now on the 513 kernels but it still maintains the 54102 and it maintains the 513.28 and it maintains now 513.32 now after I had done all this everything seemed to be fine everything was good um, one thing that happened, I saw there was a kernel update. So when I did a uname dash a to just look at the kernel here, this was 30 right there. Right? I said, okay, fine. That's that. I have no trouble with that. That's usually what happens. It requires a reboot. So I rebooted. System came up perfectly fine. Right? Everything looked good. Except when I was getting the cameras ready for OBS and stuff like that. And I did a D message. Right? Like this. I was flooded with endless pages of USB errors. Page after page after page of it. So I said, okay, well, obviously there's something not right with the kernel. So what I have to do is roll it back. So normally when I roll it when you want to roll a kernel back in an environment like this, you simply reboot, go to the grub menu and pick the previous kernel. In my case, it was 28 instead of 30, and you know, reboot. Except for a damn problem, I rebooted, no grub menu. Well, it turns out one of the flaws in this system, and I'm not sure if this is Ubuntu flaw or a KD Neon dev flaw fault, but if you go into EC de default, this is where some default files are kept, and then we look at grub. This is the basic template for what Grub's going to go look for. So, 
see these grub default grub timeout well they were both at zero which meant the menu would never ever set and I'm going what the heck now this is where I made my first mistake now I thought the um, boot entries in here were numbered like I mean it says zero so I assumed that zero was the 30 kernel and one the next one down in the block would be the 28 kernel and two would be like that uh, 102 kernel from the 5.4 and I changed this I put I set this to two right because I had also tried out okay um, grub wasn't coming up okay there's another way around it I only learned about this toward the end right I decided to install uh, a newer kernel now there's a tool you could install called mainline and mainline looks at all the Ubuntu kernels and we'll just find mr. mainline I think it's in here somewhere uh, yeah this guy right here so this goes and gets in into all the kernels that are in, in, in. so you can see here we have now 5 16 12 right and I'm all the way back here at the stable 5 13 uh, 0 I think it is right here there it is there's the one I'm installed right now 31 and 32 0.35 or versus 28.31 okay so I said well I, at the time on last weekend it was sitting at 515 like this 19 or something like this so I decided I would install that kernel okay no problem kernel installed I had it is in the menu I booted it up no problem got into the kernel except I had no networking devices. If I did a, um, I have config for example, right? There was nothing there. It was just a loopback. And when I went looking in LS mode for the driver, if we grab for R8169, which is the driver on this motherboard. Now that's the Realtek 8169 network interface, and it is common as borscht. Like, I mean, it is the defunct chip on a lot of motherboards, right? It wasn't built. And I'm going, what the heck? Why is it not built? So I had no networking. I would have built the thing. That wasn't really an issue. I could have built it, right? But I didn't have a copy of it here. Uh, I can't get to the internet to get a copy because I have no internet. Well, no networking, right? So I said, okay, well what I'll do is I'll change grub and I did that so now my table was number 0 was the f uh, the 15 kernel number 1 was the 1330 kernel number 2 should have been the 1328 kernel okay fine so 0 1 2 I put 2 in there and I reboot it after writing it out um, okay boys why am I in the bias I jumped it hung for a long time on boot like the screen that shows the loading and I end up in the bias okay well how do I get back onto the hard drive again so uh, I decided well okay I, I'll do the reinstall grub emergency stuff okay so let me bring up the browsers and there is a link less my notes on here and we will bring that and we'll go over here oops we don't have a uh, chrome just a sec properties we need a chrome <laughs> Here we go. So, uh, 
Oh, that's funky. There we go. So there's a lot of these pages out here, but this is the particular one I needed, but I didn't find it the first pass. I found very similar pages, but it was missing the EFI setups. So the idea behind this is you boot a, 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 a distro, it doesn't matter what, get to the command prompt, and you mount your drive as on mount. I'd like to tell you right here, uh, here. Now this particular one talks about if you got encryption. I didn't have encryption, so I kind of ignored that. Um, what I did is then mounted. Um, I didn't have this instruction right here, so um, I wasn't mounting the EFI directory, and that was a problem. I couldn't complete the grub reinstall because it kept complaining I didn't have EFI set up properly. So at that point of time, I thought. Oh, okay. I'll back up my uh, ETC and I'll back up my root and put them on the home tree because it's a separate drive. No problem. I'll just reinstall. Why not? Right? So I installed. Well, the first time I tried to reinstall, I ended up with a F disking issue where it didn't like my F disking. So I wiped everything out on the booting drive and did it again. This time it was good, but except it defaulted to extended for and I wanted XFS as my uh, booting. Uh, file system so another pass at this I did it again right and I put it in and I got it all going right and installed so I now had a new stock install okay uh, of course I had to put all the apps back in and stuff like that right but this was futzing around for like four hours of crap doing this and then I realized okay well um, I'm still getting the 30 kernel I need to back up to the 28 kernel right after the install um, so at first I thought I'll just change the grub menu right and guess what I end up back in the BIOS again so obviously editing that default file was screwing it up that's where the screw up was coming from so I did this page again went through all the process fixed my grub back in the OS again okay I said well, so what's going on right um, so in to ensure that I only had the 28 kernel in I put a lock on it so I put an apt hold and I marked the four kernel um, uh, pieces and control apt like this you do a oops, let me switch over here you do this type of line instead of unhold you do hold okay so what I was doing here, I was putting a hold on the main packages, the generic, the headers, the image, and the image, it's, uh, image headers and the image itself, so that the kernel wouldn't update. So I, w I froze it at 28, just to ensure. And then after I did all this and everything was good, I was at work on Monday, and it hit me. I forgot a tool I should have used, and that's called Grub customizer right so I went in and I installed it you can apt install grub customizer right there right what you end up with is a tool kinda like mainline and where's mr. mainline we don't really need it to open anymore we go and open this again and we go and find settings grub customizer and of course you have to have the secret password um, and what it does is shows your grub menu so this is what we currently have in the grub menu and currently the booting one is this one right here this is the default okay and you can go here and see default entry predefined first entry first entry being this one but you could go back and pick this one and when you save it out it will change that grub default correctly now this is where I found out that zero was not supposed to be there it's actually double quotes 
and with this in the quotes this is actual text and I'm going wow okay that's unobvious and you can change the default entry to how much boots show the menu look for other operating systems we don't have any other operating systems. we don't really need it right so for example right now we know the 32 kernel is working good the 30 is not even there anymore like it it's disappeared from the uh, thing so I'm gonna do this and this right and I will go and save it and now if we go into etc default and buy the grub file see what I mean by the top right there yep not zero not one not two wow okay uh, appearance settings I can change the boot and stuff like that but so I can now when it boots up it will always pick this kernel for example um, I don't you need to run the of uh, course the um, update grub so I'm gonna just put this back as first entry right and you can do all these sorts of things uh, grub timeouts grub timeout style hidden I think what that means is that it doesn't actually show the grub menu unless you hold the shift key down when you're booting um, I'm going to save it see that's what it does so if I had installed this the first time I could have avoided an OS install reinstall and everything I, I could have done that grub repair if I had found it right away and I could have put this in and I could have picked the right kernel yada 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 and I would be back in business but as they say hindsight is 2020 what's this button for but that was a lesson not good so once I got everything back in order um, I installed all the applications back surprisingly wine went back in very easily um, if you're wondering I need wine to run the for the um, um, the flashing tool for ROMs um, this guy right here so I have one of these TL8662 pluses for flashing EEPROMs and the software only runs in Windows <coughs> but obviously you see it here and it runs just fine now currently at the moment the program is not attached so that's why you get this demo thing so all that stuff was put in back in place I put back um, Chrome I put back I haven't put back Eclipse yet I haven't decided if I want to um, the other stuff uh, Visual Studio Code had to go back in and then I ran into a second issue with Visual Studio Code um, everything else was working perfectly no more uh, errors with the USB bus network angles were fine right but when I installed uh, went to look at some new stuff from unexpected maker so I just happened to stick these things on here um, that was a feather and this was another one here and I think this is another one here well, that's a feather s3 so I should have two of everything uh, two of those two of those and 
it's a feather. Oh, where's my second one? Well, that's strange. Uh, two of those, and I'm missing one of these. Feather, feather, feather. Too many feathers. Maker, maker. Feather. Hmm, what did I do with the one? Yeah, just give me a sec here. Why am I missing one of these? Yep, there it is. Unexpected Maker. So, Unexpected Maker puts some new S3 boards out. So, we have the um, Feather version, the Pro version, and the Teeny version. Now, if you're wondering why they look different here, and... <laughs> it's because I actually have this one upside down. So it actually goes this way. The reason for this, I wanted to put the battery connector on the bottom here. So, and if you put the battery connector on this form of the teeny, this in this way, right here, uh, you can't plug this into a breadboard anymore. So I decided on the teenies, at least I would flip it around because the pros and the uh, feathers, the battery connectors, uh, they're not done that way, so Boards away here. So I was fiddling, as you said, with Visual Studio Code. So when I put a teeny on, I picked my first teeny, I plugged it in, and I happen to have a cable here, like so. We will go mount this circuit pie. It's this one. And we will go to Mr. Circuit Pie's directory. Now, this VSA code didn't exist, of course, and this tiny didn't exist. So I'm just going to delete them for the moment. Okay. So this is how it looks when it, it shipped. Um, I had already done the. Um, uh, firmware update to the current 7.2 release version of the uh, maker but when I was after I installed uh, Visual Studio Code 1.64.2 I ran into an issue with these uh, and at first I thought it was uh, unexpected makers boards that were causing me the issue but when I threw a stock um, feather on here like the RP2040 feather right it had the problem also so <coughs> what happened was I would bring up this Visual Studio code like this and I go like this and I'd use the usual open folder in circuit pi and say okay now first thing it's going to do is create the VS code see the blue blinking light in the corner for the moment well it's building that file the settings JSON file see and when you go down here to choose a board and you say um, 
unexpected maker so we'll say tiny s3 because that's what this is blue blinky again it goes and writes some more stuff out if we look at this now it's got this and it's got this here and at first it did this file correctly but when I came to the point to write out the uh, um, the workspace folder save workspace as so I decided you know unexpected maker uh, tiny s3 and I said save right here like so again we get blinky blinky blue at the corner you see the file here but when I opened it up this was mostly empty and I go okay and this was sticking with a blue icon up here saying oh you still have unsaved changes this these should have been saved automatically right so I said save file and then it goes into his dumb error and says oh I'm sorry uh, it's taking too long to save the buffer <laughs> well after a bit of fiddling I go down here to logs let's say log main I think it was in log main or it was in log uh, shared or something like that I was seeing in here a error about the buffer and it was from Microsoft themselves saying the buffer round bracket round bracket has been deprecated due to security risk please use buffer dot something 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 three different variants right for writing your buffer out and I was going okay but Microsoft you're the one using the wrong command so basically if something broke in 164.2 so I thought at first that um, I need just to roll back 164 because of that security fix. I checked the change logs and yeah, there's a bunch of security fixes for 0.2. So I rolled it back to 0.1. No fix. 0.0. No fix. Then I thought perhaps on these maker boards it was the Python, the 7.2. So I rolled back this Python. Uh, like I, I actually had gotten the feather out at this time and, and trying out the feather. And I'm going, hmm. Right? If the feather works and the makers don't work, then it's got to be the un unexpected maker boards. Nope. The feather started doing this. And I go, oh boy. If I can't have those two things working properly in Visual Studio Code, it's not going to work. So I went and rolled back the feather from the release 7.2 back to 7.1. Didn't change a thing. Still the same error kept occurring in Visual Studio Code. So then I said, okay this is not good it was working now it's not working as well working two weeks ago not working now what can I do okay how about the insiders build so um, Microsoft just like their Windows insiders they have a Visual Studio Code insiders so insiders happen to be version 165 it's like the nightly build of whatever it is and I installed that and by the way it installs beside the existing Visual Studio Code so you don't clobber it and all I had to do was grab the extensions directory out of the the 1642 and drop it in place in the 165 and everything I had set up was uh, all back in place again no problem so I go and um, load this maker board again um, this one here again in here no problem it writes its directories out everything works correctly it is Python 7.2 VS codes written the workspace files written. everything's working perfectly so whatever the screw up they did in 6.4.2 they fixed in 6.5 and just the other day I noticed at work that 1.6.5 was released so this version of Visual Studio Code as you can not see is 1.6.5 Ta da fixed so I then went through all these boards um, all of them and they all work perfectly now they're all written correctly now 
these boards come from a guy in Australia called Unexpected Maker. They're S3s. Now, something interesting you might not be aware of. Um, things with a silver cap on them are just like these guys, except these guys don't have the cap on it. This antenna you see here, that's this antenna here. Uh, this core is in here. But what's also in here is some other chips. Like uh, I think there's a, a storage chip and some other stuff in here if you took the shell off. Right? They just make this whole thing. Um, I can't remember when this one is done. Yeah, it is. They just they make this in a pre-done module. And what you do is you, when you get it from ESP, Expressive, you can just solder it onto your boards. You can actually get them from AliExpress, pure and simple, just that part of it, and you make the board around that component. Right? They all have that crenellation. Um, does this have crenellation? Do I have any crenellated holes? Um, yeah. So this 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 guy here on the edge here is crenellations. The idea is you could solder this board on a bigger breakout board, right? And yeah, this one too. This has crenellation. This seems to be uh, being used more often, right? So, at the moment, we're just doing the blink and cycling the uh, very tiny NeoPixel on here. But, uh, so far, so good. I mean, it looks like a really nice little set of boards. Um, the cool thing about, I think, these ones, they all have like 8 meg of storage on them. So there's quite a bit of storage. And of course I'm not going to be a dirty meanie and pull the board out from underneath everything. So I'll close the workspace. But I think I can also do Arduino on here too, if I want to. And I might I might keep one board as CircuitPython, but do the other board as Arduino. Now I did solve over there on the virtual machine the other day. I have these um, ESP32 LoRa boards. They have the interesting transmitter and receiver on it, more so than Wi-Fi. And I finally got the build structure and platform I/O working correctly. I have to take the changes I did over there and bring them over here, like the code and stuff like that. Um, I haven't done that yet on this. So. And I am going to safely remove this, like so. There we go. So, do I have a container for this? Uh, not really. So. I'll just move these over here. Let's put them on the other breadboard over here. They can sit over here. And these guys can go over here. Uh, this feather, this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here. So that was the problem I had with this Linux. So, hindsight, um, have a better plan <laughs> on how to recover. I think these notes right here uh, are key. Having a copy of those available so that you can uh, do the Grub reinstall. Um, that uh, Grub customizer to set the menu and be able to roll back if your Grub doesn't show up. I could at least run that. Um, yeah, don't expect everything to work perfectly again. Um, I haven't put VMware Player back in, of course. Uh, it's still not there. But I fixed everything else. I think everything on here is... All this stuff is working correctly. This icon here is the Insider's Build. This is the regular studio code. I actually don't need this, but it's actually being updated to 166 at the moment. So, I cannot remember, did I do Mew? Yeah, I fixed Mew. 
Um, Mu is supposed to be at uh, the new version 1.1.1 1 .1. and yes it is so it's all running um, all the cameras are working correctly uh, that's good um, which is uh, fine and dandy so we're back at a working stage again from the horrible horrible uh, screw up from last weekend Yes, it's kind of hard to record anything when I don't have anything to record. In floppy land, by the way, um, I got a whole bunch of new documentation I rooted out of the internet on Apple floppy drives. I have done a hunt around here for the one external drive, and I, for the life of me, I cannot find it around here. So I must have recycled it or did something I can't believe I did but I cannot find that floppy drive so I went to eBay and I picked up um, because you can get them from eBay uh, here eBay.ca and you go here yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Apple to disk drive. Oops. Apple. Will you cut it out? Apple to disk drive. These things. Circa 1978, so 79, something like that. So I found, uh, I think it was actually this buyer. Um, if you look at the drive, it looks pristine like really good condition. Ribbon cable's excellent. The shell is not grunged out. The front is perfect. So I picked up a couple of them from him. Um, here's another guy. These are pretty nice condition. You can see that. Of course, it's only free shipping in the US. Uh, in Canada, we still have to pay, right? And I might have to pick up one of these just for the sake of having one of these. Um, these are very, very, very interesting cards. I've been learning a lot about how they actually go together. Now I don't own a Mac, so I don't need this floppy drive. But I am interested in not this drive, the five and a quarter, but I'm looking for the three and a half version. So those are five. And a, those are the newer um, Prodos slash uh, Uni drives. Um, this is a really rare one, actually, where the two drives are together in one unit on top of your Apple. Lisa Rom. Now, I, I, I was tempted to get an Apple, like the whole complete thing like this. But one of the problems you'll see on the air is that they want too much for some, something like this. Um, unless they're one of those rare Rev Zero uh, Apple IIs, right? And this one happens to be a 2 Plus. No. I'm sorry, 760 bucks Canadian law. No. Right? This would be... In a better geo but I turned this one down because of the missing key I can't believe how many people have got damaged keys now here's something I want <laughs> this guy right here if you look on the right side of the thing you will not see the same thing as this oh there's two of them in here oh so see on this one on the right side of the uh, Apple 2C is a little floppy drive door but on this one there is not this is actually the 2c 
Plus. This one actually has the three and a half inch drive, the modified power supply, and a bunch of changes in it. Right? And it's wrong. They're listing this as five and a quarter. See? But um, they're not showing the five and a quarter drive. Yeah, see something like this? Now that's a this is a platinum edition Apple IIe. You can tell by the logo on it, but it's just grunged and broken and crap. It's like, and you're wanting this for it? No way. You know. And of course, this page, even though you say Apple II disk drive, comes up with too many things. So if you say Apple II uh, vintage computing. Yeah, so you could clean this one, but I believe they said there's no power supply. Yeah, and by the way, the power supply is kind of unique to these things. You you do want it. So that one looks good. Now that's an original Apple II. You can see on the logo, it's not a plus. It's actually an Apple II. This is the first Apple IIe's with the double drive on the tour. Now this one's good, right? This one's actually really nice condition, but they want way too much money for it. This is also an original, but they want to, well this is not bad. If you wanted a deal, a bit of cleanup, the keyboard is complete, right? That's what I would look for. This one's okay if you can clean all the damn stickers and everything and then take the mods out. Someone heavily modded that. But I did get that and then I picked up um there's another thing where you can get a um an emulator that uh fakes out a collection of Apple II diskettes and you just pick it from a menu what diskette to boot and to the Apple it thinks you have the floppy drive hooked up and the same person that makes that one um, also makes a nice adapter from DB to ribbon cable for the Apple IIc which is what I have I have an Apple IIc here so and I've given a bunch of documentation and stuff on the Apple. I'm thinking in order to read an Apple floppy drive properly, um, the two PROMs that are on the controller card, uh, what they call P5 and P6, need to be actually emulated inside of CircuitPython in order to correctly boot a uh, floppy drive, to run a floppy drive. I noticed that Jepler was trying to do, uh, he's one of the guys at Adafruit, he's trying to do a, a, a sinkhole for the floppy to figure out where the floppy is. That's not the way the apples actually work at all. Um, they don't have anything in them uh, except the ability to spin the disk, move the head, and of course read and write. That's it. That's all they can do. Right? But you it's up to you in software to figure out where the sectors are all that sort of stuff on a PC floppy disk that's not the case there is extra electronics in the drive in the controller card that helps you do all that so you don't have to do it in software right but that's not the way the Apple's twos worked now I'm not 100% sure how the Apple um, Max worked like their their 800k floppies and stuff like that so and I'm not sure how ProDOS works. This is all um, DOS 3.3 on the Apple side. And by the way, it has no correspondence to um, DOS 3.3 on the PC side. They just so happen to be both called DOS, and these both happen to be version 3.3. So, but I think even in, in the DOS world, I think we jumped from 2.11 to 3.0, then 3.1, and then 4.1, and then 5. And then 6 was allowed for a long, long time. Technically, there's a DOS 7, 
um, you get it from Windows 98 um, SE because Windows 98 sits on top of DOS uh, it wasn't until we jumped to um, Windows 2000 that the OS um, did away with that that OS2 is the same idea. Like I mean, OS2 does not sit on top of um, the o, uh, DOS-like operating system. Is actually that was the operating system, just like 2000 is the OS, but not. It doesn't sit on top of the DOS system. Which means you can actually, if you got it all correct, you can actually run in the DOS EMU in Linux if you're <laughs> willing to do this. You can run DOS and then run Windows 3.11. Yes, you could have it all. Um, so, I think I'll cut it here. But that was my trials and tribulations of uh, blowing up the Linux last weekend and fixing it all. And a little bit of new boards. My current status on working on the floppy drive stuff. I have all my Apple documentation here and stuff, and I found a whole bunch of more. So it's a bunch of reading I have to do. Yes, I like to jump around in projects. Jump, jump, jump. That sort of thing. So now if you have any idea, questions about how I, specific areas I might have looked at in Linux, or you want more Linux-related um, stuff I was doing, you know, stuff in here the old command line let me know um, I can always do that and I think we'll back the font on don't there I think that's what it was no nope, we're still too big there we go So I think on the next vid I'll get back to uh, uh, more of the floppy controller. Hopefully the drives will be here and then I can actually try making a, a connector to it and stuff like that. So I hope they work. They better. They looked really good condition. So, but it's eBay. So Oh, and I did pass the, I forgot about this, I did pass the um, Apple IIc's video into one of my monitors here through a composite S-Video to HDMI upscaler converter, and it worked like a charm. I'm going to get another uh, different type of little capture thing and another one of those little converters, and I'm going to rig it so that I can actually capture the Apple II, sorry, the Apple IIc screen and be able to put it in OBS and we'll be able to see this the actual Apple IIc stuff I have to actually get back and re relearn some uh, uh, Apple commands I've forgotten so much but that's enough for another job so I will cut it there this is it